Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. In our previous video we talked about the logic of the null hypothesis significance test and how we can get a p-value that will then help us decide whether we reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. In this module I want to talk a little bit more about p-values and how we can avoid some misinterpretations of p-values that are very common in the literature. So first, as a reminder, right, if you haven't watched the previous video, please do so, but null hypothesis significance tests require that we assume that the null hypothesis is true, and therefore we might assume, for instance, that the true mean is equal to zero, so then we'll get a null distribution that looks like this. And again, we can assume that the distribution of sample means under the null hypothesis is approximately normal, given the central limit theorem. So, you know, as long as we're talking about making inferences about a sample mean, this kind of uh, sampling distribution is going to apply. And under the null hypothesis, we would expect something like the distribution in red. Then that means when we observe a sample mean, right, which could fall anywhere along the x-axis here, we have to make a decision about whether we think that's a statistically interesting finding, or is that like reasonable to occur under the null hypothesis just due to sampling variability. And we you know, gave some examples where we said, okay, if it's near zero, that's pretty reasonable to occur under the null hypothesis due to sampling variability alone. If it's really far out, that's very unlikely to occur under the null hypothesis by sampling variability alone. But then we ran into an issue where if it's in a more of a kind of a middle ground, right, then it's hard to say exactly how unlikely does something need to be before we think it's a statistically unusual result. And, uh, you know, certainly we could think about these things a little more continuously, perhaps, but one of the nice reasons for setting a threshold that we talked about is that it allows us to control the type 1 error rate very effectively. So in general, we'll carve out the middle 95% of the distribution away from the top 2.5% and the bottom 2.5% by setting the alpha level to 5%, right? And what that means is if our alpha level is 5%, we're only going to make a type one error, right, which is erroneously conclude, erroneously rejecting the null when it is true 5% of the time, right? And hopefully that, that logic is clear to you as a reminder kind of in this figure, because if we set alpha to 0.05, then we have 2.5% in this tail and 2.5% in this tail under a two-sided hypothesis. Uh, and if you need a refresher on some of those topics, you know, you can watch the previous video. So, like we said though, it's not just whether something crosses P of 0.05 or, or doesn't cross P of 0.05, but we're gonna get a continuous p-value. And, and you know that p-value might be smaller than 0.05, it might be smaller than 0.01, right? Or it might also be quite large. Um, and these p-values are one piece of information that we can use in the interpretation of our results. And used correctly, these p-values are a very useful tool in science. Unfortunately, it's also very easy to misinterpret these p-values and it can lead to many misunderstandings. So I want to take a little bit of time to focus on how to interpret the p-value and especially how not to interpret the p-value when we're doing these calculations, for instance, for our t-tests. So again, used correctly, frequentist p-values can be very useful tools in science. And strictly speaking, the correct interpretation of the p-value is the probability of observing data these extreme or more extreme under the null hypothesis. Uh, and to use the kind of st the statistical notation here, then we're calculating the probability, p, of observing data um, x, so in this case a sample mean, uh, at that size or greater, and then this vertical bar you can kind of read as given that the null hypothesis is true. So given that the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of observing a sample mean of x bar or greater? Um, and that also assumes then that all of the other assumptions in our statistical model hold, uh, and for instance one of those assumptions is that sampling variability is the only factor working on our data. So, you know, if we're, you know, kind of weeding people out of our sample because they aren't behaving the way that we expect them to, sampling variability isn't going to be the only factor working on our data. If there are, you know, some mathematical artifacts in the calculations that we're obtaining, sampling variability might not be the only factor working on our data. So there are a lot of other assumptions that go into this null hypothesis significance test, and, and we will talk more about those in subsequent modules. But assuming that all of those assumptions hold, right, what we are interested in is if this p-value is low enough, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because the data that we observe are unlikely to have arisen if the null hypothesis were true. So the p-values then, in kind of a slightly simplified, but I would argue still correct definition, indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model, which includes the null hypothesis and all of its other assumptions. And like I said, again, assuming that all of those other assumptions are accurate, then the, the thing that stands out is the null hypothesis, and that's the part that gets rejected. Now, 
we can take this a little bit further than to say, thus, if p is less than 0.05, then that is unusual under the null hypothesis and suggests that something systematic might be going on. Uh, that doesn't guarantee that something systematic is going on, right? It's still certainly possible to make a false positive and erroneously reject the null hypothesis when we shouldn't. But that is the virtue of the null hypothesis significance test, is that if we set that alpha criterion at a particular point, then we're controlling the, the frequency of um, making those type 1 errors. Now, unfortunately, it's also very easy to misinterpret a p-value, and this can lead to many misunderstandings. So there's a lot of different incorrect interpretations of the p-value out there. Uh, you might have heard some of these before if you're familiar you know, with, with statistics or you've been involved in research, right? But I think given its relationship to inference and decision-making in science, oftentimes people think about a p-value of less than 0.05, meaning that an effect is somehow real. But that's simply not true. Recall that when fall, you know, that false positives can happen under the null hypothesis. In fact, they'll happen 5% of the time, which is a pretty decent percentage of the time. That's a 1 in 20 chance, right? So having a p-value less than 0.05 in no way means that this effect that you've observed is real or necessarily going to be reliable from sample to sample. Similarly, kind of people make the reverse mistake and they assume that if a p is greater than 0.05 then that means there was no effect or no difference right now if you in a hypothetical situation let's say you get a difference between two group means that was five milliliters per kilogram you're measuring some kind of like oxygen uptake in your participants uh, under two different treatment conditions and you get a p-value you know of, of 0.6 okay so that's a pretty big p-value it's very compatible with the null hypothesis but the difference was still 5 milliliters per kilogram. You didn't find no difference. You found a difference of 5 milliliters per kilogram that carried with it a p-value of 0.6. So even though we are using this p of 0.05 as, as kind of a helpful benchmark for you know, when do we want to make a decision, um, it, that is just one piece of evidence that we need to consider when, when we're actually trying to make conclusions about what our data are telling us. And it is really critically important to remember that just because something has a p-value greater than 0.05 and we might say it is not statistically significant, that does not mean there's no effect or no difference that we're actually observing in those data. Similarly, the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is correct. So if we say that we got a p-value of, let's say, 0.01, that does not mean there's a 1% chance the null hypothesis was correct. And we can see this pretty concretely, right? If we think about what that p-value actually is when we write it with the proper notation, right? So we can only calculate the p-value if we first assume that the null is true. So if we're assuming that the null is true, how do we get the p-value that it's incorrect, right? Or, or correct. Um, and, you know, so what we're, what we're doing when we calculate these frequentist p-values is getting the probability of observing the sample statistic or, uh, of that size or larger given that the null hypothesis is true. If we want to flip these probabilities around and we say, okay, now we want to know the probability of a particular hypothesis given the data, first off, that's going to change based on what this hypothesis is. Um, but also, this is a fundamentally different probability if you compare these two, right? This is the probability of a hypothesis given the data. This is the probability of the data given a hypothesis. And asking this question down below is entirely valid but it requires a different set of statistical tools um, that fall under the umbrella of Bayesian statistics um, that are very different from the frequentist statistics that we're taking here. They're, they're very much related, of course, um, but they generally rely on some other model assumptions that we, we might get to uh, some Bayesian statistics in a future video. Um, but in general, the, the thing that we need to take away from right now is that we're using frequentist statistics to calculate these p-values, and that tells us about the probability of the data assuming the null is true, and the reverse inference is not the same. It, we, we can't treat this p-value as the probability of a hypothesis given the data. And finally, um, you might often hear the p-value described as the probability that these results occurred due to chance, and this is, I mean, it's definitely wrong, but it, it kind of works as like a layperson shorthand, you know? So I would say if you're maybe describing p-values to your, uh, your, your, your family members and your friends, assuming that they don't have a background in statistical inference, then this might be a convenient way of kind of summarizing that. But in a technical sense, and in science, it's very important that we're technically correct, uh, this is not an accurate description. 
And the reason for that is that the p-value reflects the compatibility of the observed data with a specific null hypothesis. It's not amorphous chance. It's saying, assuming this very specific hypothesis is true, what is the probability of observing an effect of this size or larger? Had we chosen a different null hypothesis, then the p-value would be different. The same chance, right, if we're thinking about chance as kind of sampling variability, would be a factor in both situations. So if the p-value is different, but the same sampling variability is at play both times, then the p-value isn't a reflection of chance, right? It might be a reflection sort of chance under that particular null hypothesis, but that's a very important detail to remember. The p-value reflects the compatibility of the observed data with a very specific null hypothesis, and if you change that null hypothesis, the p-value is also going to change. So finally, I think a nice way of thinking about p-values is reframing them as coin flips. Um, and we, we can do this with a little bit of a mathematical uh, transformation, but you could also do this just by, um, you know, multiplying the probabilities together yourself. So, you know, to get two uh, tails in a row, you'd take 0.5 times 0.5, because that's the probability of getting tails on each individual coin flip. If you're getting three tails in a row, that would be 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, right? And you could work through it that way. But a, a, a nice way to kind of reverse that and go from the probability back to the number of coin flips is to take the negative log base two of the probability. Now, admittedly, this doesn't fall into discrete numbers, so it's gonna give us some, some decimals, but we can think about this as the approximate number of tails. Um, and people actually uh, think about this, or they label this as the, the S value or the surprise value um, for, for, and they call it the S value for actually for Claude Shannon. So some people say, you know, S value and surprise value, but the S actually is for Shannon, named after the mathematician Claude Shannon and his work in information theory. Um, but anyway, that's an aside. This, if we think, if we take these P values and we translate them into S values, which is essentially the number of heads or tails in a row, we can see just how likely or unlikely certain events are. Right, so a probability or a p-value of 0.1 under the null hypothesis is the same as about getting about three uh, tails in a row, which isn't super surprising. Now, a p-value of 0.06 is the same as getting about four heads in a row, which is a little more unlikely. 0.03 is you know getting five heads in a row. Uh, 0.01 now that's getting close to getting seven heads in a row. And if we had a p-value of 0.001, that'd be the same as getting about ten heads in a row. Right? And you can think, well, three heads in a row isn't especially unusual if I was flipping a coin several times. Um, but, but you know, you know, kind of similarly, four tails in a row, well, that's more unusual when I'm flipping a coin. Now, if I get 10 tails in a row, that's pretty unusual. That's going to start to make me doubt, you know, that like, is my coin fair? Is it biased to come up tails in some way? Right? It seems like there's something systematic going on if I'm getting 10 tails in a row on in seemingly independent coin flips. Then on this table, we can draw a line for our alpha level, right? Where if something is greater than 0 0.05, um, we would not consider it statistically significant. If something is less than 0 0.05, we would consider it statistically significant. But one of the things that I hope you will notice, right, is when I draw this line, a P of 0 0.06, a P of 0 0.05, and a P of 0 0.04 are not all that different. In fact, a P of 0.06 is as close to being significant as a P of 0.04 is to not being statistically significant. So there's nothing magical about a P of 0.05 here, right? If we cross that threshold, that doesn't mean that suddenly we've established truth and that something is real and factual. It just means it was slightly more unlikely under the null hypothesis. And actually, that's not even a super high degree of evidence, right? Again, thinking about it in terms of coin flips, if we set our bar as, well, that's as likely as getting four heads in a row, getting four heads in a row happens all the time, right? That's not that surprising. Um, so it, it's not a particularly high bar, but we also want to remember that we don't want to set that bar much, much lower because if we said, okay, well, the new alpha is always going to be 0 0.001. Basically, I need to get 10 tails in a row before I decide to reject the null hypothesis that's going to come with its own complications because if I make the type 1 error rate super low, I'm now making the type 2 error rate that much higher and I'm more likely to miss an effect that might actually be present and interesting um, because I've set my type 1 error rate too high. So this, this is complicated and it's difficult.
Uh, and, but the thing that I want to convince you about is that the p-value is a very useful piece of information, but it answers one very specific question, and it should only be one consideration that we make uh, when, when thinking about our data and how we want to use it in either future, future experiments or drawing conclusions about our data uh, with respect to scientific hypotheses.